Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, representing the city and county of Broomfield. I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the May 22nd, 2023 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. It is 1.31 p.m. In this in-person and live stream meeting format, members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that you've typed your, your typed name reflects your first, last name, and your representation. We ask that those attending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have any questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions or comments. As a reminder, during the business agenda, only TAC members and alternates may speak or ask questions. Members of the public may speak during public comment. And as a reminder to members and alternates here in person, please make sure the light on your microphone is on when you are uh, prepared to speak, and please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify. Uh, also, please announce your name and representation for the record uh, into the microphone. Cam is sending around a sign-in sheet. Please sign in, and at this time, TAC members and alternates in person will introduce themselves. Um, we'll start at the end uh, with Mr. Whitaker. Mike Whitaker, Jeffco Lakewood. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Evan Ash, Weld County, Frederick. Kent Mormon, Adams County, Thornton. Jeff Dankenbring, Arapahoe County, City of Centennial. Chris Hudson, Douglas County, Town of Parker. Uh, Justin Schmitz, uh, Douglas County, City of Lone Tree. Hi, good afternoon. Oh, I'm sorry. Michelle Malinakis, City of Lafayette, Boulder County. Now it's, uh, I'm Sean Poe, Commerce City, sorry. Brian Weimer, Arapahoe County. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cog Staff. Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog Staff. Marissa Gahan, CDOT. Maria DeAndre, City of Wheat Ridge. Dean Sanson, City of Boulder. Lisa Wynn, Denver International Airport. Ellison, City of Aurora. Bill Soroy, RTD. Jennifer Bartlett, City and County of Denver. Alex Hyderite, Boulder County. Carson Priest, TDM non-motorized seat. Josh Schwank, Dr. Cogstaff. David Gasper, City and County of Denver. Jessica Michelbus, Colorado Department of Transportation, Region. Great, thank you. Is that everybody here for members and alternates? Uh, we'll now move on to, I'd like to pass it off to Mr. Rieger to make some uh, announcements and introductions. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. So a couple announcements related to ongoing membership changes at TAC, um, but I wanna start by welcoming some new folks um, and then talk about that in the broader context of membership changes. But at least today, I do wanna welcome Sean Poe from Commerce City. Sean, thanks for being here. I don't see Sarah Dusenberry from North Glen, but she's a new alternate, so welcome to Sarah. Um, Tom Moore, Tom Moore is here from RAC, uh, new member from RAC. Um, did I miss anyone for new members? Okay. Um, I also know that sitting in the back are several to be new members, so I want to talk about that for a moment. Um, as you all may recall, you worked on this last fall. We updated our Dr. Cog committee guidelines for several of our committees, including TAC. There were several big changes for TAC that are coming to fruition. One of those is that the six largest urban counties, uh, the sub-regional transportation forms, will be adding a third new member and new alternate, and the forms are in the process of doing that. Several of those folks are sitting behind me. All of those folks, the new third members and alternates, will start serving at the June TAC meeting. Uh, we're also recruiting three, three more special interest seats for TAC. Remember that historically we've had seven, seven, seven special interest seats, say that three times fast, um, of subject matter experts in allied fields related to transportation who help this committee's work. So we're filling those three new seats. Those folks will start serving um, at the June TAC meeting. And then uh, with all those other updates, we're also having just you know, a couple changes as the forums are taking action on their new members. Some of those folks are starting today. Um, some folks will start in June. 
So that leads me to say that I just want to give a heads up. We are going to send out an announcement to everyone after this meeting. Uh, we are planning for, for some special things for the June TAC meeting. Um, the details are still being worked out, but in the broad strokes, we are going to have a lunch uh, for all of the TAC members, new and returning, uh, 12 o'clock on June 26th here at, here at Dr. Cog. Uh, so we do please invite you to come to that kind of a meet and greet networking session for all the new folks. Um, and then we'll do a couple orientation things as part of the June TAC meeting with all the new members and alternates and new special interest seat members. Um, so look for further details to come, um, but I encourage everyone to attend for that. I think it's going to be fun. With some of those changes, I know we're also losing a couple folks, and I do want to acknowledge their service. Um, coming off TAC is Brooke Saboveda from North Glen. Uh, we're going to miss him. He's still at North Glen, but just coming off TAC. Um, he did mention to me, and I thought this was interesting, he said, ironically for Ron, he would have had his work cut out for him researching my history like he did for Deborah, since I served on and off the TAC and other doc, Dr. Cog committees since 1996. Um, Brooke has been an institution on TAC and in Dr. Cog work, and I want to acknowledge his service. Also coming off TAC is George Holikoff from Denver International Airport. Um, there will be a new representative starting in June, um, but George has been on the committee for a couple of years at least. Um, I want to acknowledge George ser George's service as well. So I think those are all the membership updates for now, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rieger and Brooke and George. Thank you for your service on the Dr. Cog TAC and welcome to the new members and alternates and looking forward to introducing new members next month. Uh, now we will move on to public comment. Uh, public comment is limited to three minutes. And as a reminder, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates will be able to partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. If you've joined by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you join by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we'll call on you in your last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You'll have three minutes to speak in which you will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder, everyone, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates may speak. Do we have anybody for public comment today here in person or online? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I don't see any at this moment, but I'll give it a second. And I don't see any hands raised. Thank you, Cam. Um, at this time, we will move on to the meeting summary. So uh, please, in your agenda packet is included in the April 24th, 2023 TAC meeting summary. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about that meeting summary from the last meeting? Seeing none, uh, the meeting summary shall stand. Um, we'll move on to action items. Please note that uh, there was an addendum to this, um, to the meeting packet for the action items, item four and four one. Uh, they are all a part of the 2022 to 2025 transportation improvement program amendments. And separately, 4.1 will be the I-70 uh, harvest station interchange. And um, I'll hand it over to Josh to walk us through these uh, action items. And once again, we will actually do these as two separate action items. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so we do have uh, three policy amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program as part of this item. Uh, two of these are related. Um, so back in 2008, the Dr. Cog Board made a second commitment in principle to the Fast Tracks Program. Uh, funding within that commitment was dedicated to particular corridors. Uh, so this is using the remaining funding for the uh, Southwest Corridor and uh, dedicating that to multimodal improvements uh, to Mineral Avenue that will help access to Mineral Station. So uh, the two amendments would be removing that funding from the second commitment to Fast Tracks pool in the TIP and then programming the new Littleton project uh, for Mineral Avenue improvements. Uh, thirdly, uh, we have a, pro a project for the I-25 Segment 5 uh, we'll be adding new funding that includes $11 million in state legislative funding, as well as federal TIFIA, fund, federal TIFIA loans in the amount of $185 million. So happy to take any questions about any of those. Otherwise, I do have a proposed motion available for you on the screen and in your packet. Any questions for Mr. Schwenk? Mr. Weiber? Can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. 
thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, with regard to uh, this action item, I move to recommend the, to the Regional Transportation Committee projects that were just discussed for the 22 to 2025 transfer. Thank you, Mr. Weimer. Uh, we have a second. Uh, Kent Norman. Second. Uh, any uh, discussion? Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Any abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Schwenk. I'll uh, hand it back to you for 4.1. Thanks, Madam Chair. So we did have an additional project uh, that requested um, to be added to the Transportation Improvement Program. This is for the new I-70 and Harvest Road interchange. Um, this is actually a locally funded project. Uh, it includes $30 million in local funds, uh, but because it is regionally significant in regards to air quality, it does need to be added to the TIP before construction can begin. Uh, so we are requesting to add that to the TIP at this time. Uh, so. Again, happy to answer any questions about this project. Otherwise, I do have an additional proposed motion available for you. Thank you, Mr. Schwenk. Any questions or comments? Mr. Mormon. I would uh, move to recommend the re to the Regional Transportation Committee the attached project, I mean, 2022-2025 Transportation Improvement. Second. Thank you. Was that second from Mr. Weimer? Thank you. Uh, all in favor? I'm sorry, excuse me. Any, uh, any further discussion? All in favor? Say aye. 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 Uh, anyone opposed? And abstentions? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will move on to our um, informational items here. Our first informational briefing will be item number five in your PACMET, uh, attachment C, the Dr. Cog Transportation Demand Management uh, TDM Strategic Plan Update. And I'll hand it over to Callie Fallon, Emerging Mobility and TDM Planner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kaylee Fallon. Um, I am the Emerging Mobility and TDM Planner here at Dr. Cog. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so this might be a little bit of a refresher for some folks, but just so that we're all on the same page, a high-level overview of what the TDM strategic plan is and why we are doing that. Um, so the TDM strategic plan was identified in Dr. Cog's fiscal year um, 22 to 23 UPWP, um, and it relates to Dr. Cog's internal programs and projects um, related to multimodal connectivity and TDM. Um, essentially, this this um, strategic TDM plan is an overhaul to Dr. Cog's current existing um, short-range TDM plan. Um, and so the purpose of this plan essentially is to broaden the scope of what Dr. Cog defines as TDM, um, evaluate existing TDM programs, practices, partnerships, and policies within the region, engage our stakeholders, and identify desired actions and activities um, to support TDM in our region. And ultimately, this plan um, supports MetroVision outcomes, specifically um, a multimodal and connected region. Um, one of of the main deliverables of this plan will be a regional TDM toolkit um, for Dr. Cog and partners to use in implementation of TDM actions and activities. So looking at travel trends throughout the region, um, we see that 45% of trips are less than three miles and 19% of trips are less than one mile. So there is a huge opportunity in the region um, to mode to shift modes um, within these short trip opportunity zones, which we are targeting through the TDM strategic plan. Um, and so an update on the scope of work, um, we have Tasks one, two, and three currently either underway or completed. Um, so task one is 
the um, stakeholder outreach and engagement. This is ongoing uh, throughout the entire length of the project. Um, task two includes the existing conditions analysis. This also has the equity analysis and ROI component to it. Um, the existing conditions analysis has been completed and the equity analysis and ROI assessment are currently underway. And then task three, the planning framework that is currently underway as well. Um, so I'll just kind of go through each of those tasks really quickly as an update. Um, and so to inform tasks one and two, um, we started off with case studies. Um, these were case studies throughout North America, so both um, throughout the United States, and we even had a case study example um, in Canada. Um, but those were looking at regional entities that have TDM programs to identify those best practices and lessons learned. And then we shared those with the stakeholder steering committee, um, and that was just to really look at what are other folks throughout um, the TDM world doing, how can we learn from them, um, and kind of just setting the stage for that stakeholder engagement and this plan. And then for task two, the existing conditions, what we did for that, um, we took an inventory of current TDM programs, services, partnerships, and funding throughout the region. Um, we did this by looking at local transportation master plans and TDM specific plans throughout the region. Um, we even looked at state plans as well. Um, and then we did a regional mapping analysis to inform the existing conditions analysis. So really just looking at what are we doing as a region right now what are we doing at the state level? What is the current, you know, existing conditions of TDM? And we, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, so for stakeholder engagement, this, like I said, is ongoing throughout the project. We have hosted three workshops um, with our stakeholder steering committee um, to date. Um, the first one was back in October, the second one was in December, the third one and most recent one was in March, and we have an upcoming um, stakeholder steering committee at the end of June. Um, and so out of those three workshops, there was one workshop where it was combined with the regional TDM consortium. Um, this is a group of folks that are, um, I would say, broader stakeholders. So their work is um, definitely related to TDM, but perhaps it's not TDM day in and day out. And so um, we did have one combined workshop with those folks and our stakeholder steering committee as well. Um, and, and going off of the regional TDM consortium, we did just wrap up our focus groups two weeks ago. Um, these focus groups are really important because what we learned in um, these interviews and the feedback that we got will inform the regional TDM toolkit, which is one of the deliverables of the plan. Um, so as you see on the screen, we had um, six different focus groups. We had mobility operators, those folks that are involved in TDM and equity, large, em large employers, um, land use that was um, de developers and our rural communities. And then we also had bids and TMAs within those, um, those focus groups. And so for task three, which is currently underway, the planning framework development, um, we looked at goals from Dr. Cog's Metro Vision and the 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, as well as those local transportation master plans um, to really kind of dive in and gain insight into what are the regional themes around TDM. And so looking at all those plans together, there were seven aggregated themes. Um, and so we presented these themes to the stakeholder steering committee and they ranked those um, based on perceived priority. So as you can see on the screen here are the seven themes um, that will guide the planning framework. Um, those include multimodal connectivity, air quality improvements, equity in transportation, transportation safety, transportation policy, active transportation usage, and system resiliency. And so as I mentioned, the equity analysis as well as the ROI analysis are currently underway. Um, we are utilizing Dr. Cog's equity index data set to evaluate the existing um, TDM programs and services um, that are happening within the region, um, really kind of looking at this from a, a SWOT perspective. So strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, and threats of the, of the current programs. 
what is next for the, the plan? Um, so like I said, the focus groups happened two weeks ago. We are going to use all that feedback to inform the toolkit. Um, our next stakeholder steering committee is in June, at the end of June, um, and the TDM toolkit development is slated to happen um, later this spring and early this summer. Um, there'll be a draft strategy review by partners later this summer, um, and then we will be coming back to TAC later this summer as well. There will be opportunity for input on those TDM strategies, those draft TDM strategies within the toolkit, um, and that will be available for um, additional stakeholder and public review early this, or next fall, or early fall, excuse me. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Fallon, for that update. Do we have any questions or comments from the TAC, Mr. Priest? Uh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and Kaylee. I just want to take a moment to thank Dr. Cog's staff for taking this head on as um, we come out of COVID, TDM is, um, quite different. If you talk about SWOT analysis, um, are you able to share any kind of opportunities you see in the TVM space from a regional perspective um, in that ROI analysis? Yeah, so the ROI analysis is currently underway, and I, I don't think we have gotten to a point where we're able to um, share that quite yet, but definitely happy to once we are done with that to, to share that out because definitely is an important part of this plan. Any other questions or comments from the TAC? Uh, Mr. Weimer. So thank you for uh, putting this together, the program as we work for forward. But as part of the study, are you going to establish goals of what you would like to accomplish and then how to track those goals? Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, and I should have clarified, I'm sorry. So as part of the plan, we'll be looking at both of Dr. Cog's internal working, so what Dr. Cog is doing um, as an agency in the TDM sphere, as well as what other regional partners are doing in the, in the TDM sphere. So there will definitely be goals for Dr. Cog in terms of in terms of how Dr. Cog can reevaluate how we are doing our TDM programs and services and funding. Um, and then to, your, to the second point about the, the KPIs and how we're measuring that, I think that is going to be a big focus of how do we measure TDM because I think that um, it's really hard, right? Like I, you can ask any of the, the TMAs or anyone, like how do you measure success in the TDM world? And that is a huge challenge that we're facing. So I, I think that that's something that plan will definitely consider. Um, whether or not we will come up with specific KPIs or, or specific evaluation criteria, I'm not quite sure, um, but happy to um, ask and get back to you on that. Any further questions, comments? Mr. McAllison. Thank you. Um, is there an opportunity to coordinate with CDOT uh, given their not so recent, but uh, relatively recent, a 1601 TDM framework and, and a pro forma as such. Yeah, absolutely. I think so. Um, we definitely, like I said, with that existing conditions analysis, looked at what is happening at the state level in terms of TDM. So um, CDOT being um, a valued regional partner, there's definitely opportunity for collaboration and, and synergy there. And Mac and everyone I might mention as well, um, regarding TDM, uh, regarding CDOT 1601 TDM policy, um, we've been working with CDOT in particular on I-70 Far East in your jurisdiction, Mac, um, on some of the work out there, but kind of generally coordinating with CDOT as it affects the Dr. Cog region in terms of um, implementation around uh, 1601 TDM. So it's a good point. I'm glad you raised it. Thank you. Mr. Weimer? I'll chime on to that, and that is... Um, although Senate Bill 213 did not pass, um, I suspect it will come back in some form or fashion. And with that, there was a TDM component included within that bill. So hopefully that is going to drive some of the decisions as we move forward. Potential legislation. Additional comments, questions? 
Thank you, Ms. Fallon. Thank you for the update and really appreciate the work that the Dr. Cog staff is putting into this. It's really important for our region and looking forward to what will be coming out of the toolbox and the strategic plan update. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to item number six. It is the corridor and community-based transportation planning update. This is attachment D in your packet. And I will pass it off to Nora Kern, Senior Mobility Planner. All right, let's see. Can you guys hear me okay? Um, yeah, so this is an update on two of Dr. Cog's new planning programs. Um, uh, we mentioned them last fall to you all, and we've had some progress since then, so I wanted to bring you up to speed on the current kind of pilot versions of these two programs, but also talk about some plans to continue the programs in the coming year. So um, kind of initially the, to start, the two unique things about these programs at, is that these, the corridor planning and the community-based transportation planning programs are programs where Dr. Cog retains funds and is leading some planning efforts around the region in partnership with many of you all and, and some of our other partners. Um, so that's a little bit of a unique approach for us. So we decided to start each of these programs with a pilot to kind of figure out the process, how we would pick projects, um, and kind of the, the, um, how we'd like to run the, these types of, of planning efforts in the future. So um, the, I'll start with the corridor planning program. Um, and this program is really focused on the corridors that are identified in the regional transportation plan. So if you haven't looked at it recently, there are actually a number of specific projects that are um, bus rapid transit projects, the transit priority corridors, uh, uh, multimodal um, vision zero corridors, and some other ones. These are projects that are all uh, regionally funded. And so the idea behind this program is, you know, we have these ideas in the plan. We all, we all know that they're important for the region, but we, some of them still need some planning um, to go into them before they're able to be, you know, moved forward and funded. So um, with this program, Dr. Kai is kind of uh, stepping up to kind of help corral the partners and, and bring some resources to these corridors so that we can advance projects from them in the future. Um, and we, uh, in the first pilot, um, we had a couple considerations that we, you know, took into account when picking the first couple corridors, which I think will continue in the future. So first is the RTP staging period. So of course, projects that are identified to be funded sooner rather than later are, are a higher priority. Um, regional impact is important. Um, there's lots of great planning work going on in, in everyone's jurisdiction. So we're really trying to focus on those corridors that are impacting multiple jurisdictions where there is a need for some regional collaboration. Um, planning need, again, we know there's a lot of planning work happening on, on many corridors across the region, so we don't want to double up efforts. So really looking at the corridors where there is a little bit of a gap and there's some, some work is needed to, to move that corridor forward. And then, of course, last was local jurisdiction buy-in. So we really, all of these projects we want to do in partnership with our local government partners. Um, so we developed those guidelines in the fall of last year. Um, we had a call for letters of interest in, in October and had our uh, first selection of the first two corridors over the winter. Um, so we are now in the final stages of procurement on our first two corridors and getting close to kick off. So I kind of wanted to just share a little bit about those first two. So the first is Alameda Avenue, which um, we are working on with a number of you. And so this is looking at Alameda from Wadsworth in Lakewood all the way out to the R line in Aurora. Um, it's identified as a bus rapid transit project in the 2030 staging period. Um, so, of course, we're working with Lakewood, Denver, Aurora, CDOT, RTD. Um, we have selected FHU, who's partnered with Nelson Nygaard, and this one will probably be kicking off in the next month or so. So, certainly, we'll be, uh, you know, probably hearing more about it as this study gets underway. Um, the next study is South Boulder Road. So, this is um, from Boulder to um, Lafayette. And um, this one, it's identified in the, uh, the later staging period, the 2040 staging period, as a um, transit priority corridor. So looking at um, transit enhancements, but also kind of multimodal connections and safety along the corridor. Um, of course, working with the city of Boulder, city of Lafayette, city of Louisville, Boulder County, and RTD on this corridor. So we have selected Fair and Peers, who's working with um, Kimley Horn and NHN. And I think this one, similar timeline, should be getting started pretty soon. 
Um, both of these quarters, I will mention, will have a number of ways to get involved. We're going to kind of have a core project management committee that's kind of the, the impacted um, governments who own, own parts of the road or are directly impacted. Then we'll probably have a larger um, steering committee, stakeholder committee, depending on what name we want to go with. Um, and then community engagement, of course, with uh, other partners that, that um, are impacted by these corridors. So um, these should be getting underway pretty soon. So the, that kind of brings me to the next of our new plan, planning efforts. Um, this one is the Community-Based Transportation Planning Program. Um, and so this program, I realize the title is wrong up top, I'm <laughs> looking at the packet, but the Community-Based Transportation Planning Program is really focused on some of the underserved populations in the Dr. Cog region. And so um, we're really interested in kind of taking a proactive effort to identify mobility challenges and potential solutions for um, people across the, the region who maybe have been underserved by some of the planning efforts in the past or who have kind of specific needs that um, we can help as a region help address. So um, these, these plans right now are a little bit smaller. They're, they're about $100,000 each. Um, it, similarly, we had developed some guidelines in the fall. We had a call for letters of nomination um, in the late fall and selected two communities. Um, the first community is Edgewater, which I'll mention in just a second. We've actually already kicked that study off. Um, and then the second one we're going to be kicking off this fall. Um, so in the city of Edgewater, there, we're looking at some of the communities that attend um, Edgewater and Lumberg Elementary Schools. So uh, for those familiar with the Jeffco County Schools, um, there's a nearby school closing, Mulholm Elementary, so there's a number of kids that are going to be traveling to these new schools. They already have traffic, transportation challenges. So um, these two communities, I think, are over 60% Spanish-speaking, um, so there's a number of barriers to kind of engage them with transportation planning. So we're doing a really focused um, effort with the city of Edgewater, and in both of these, we're actually going to be partnering with community-based organizations. So for this planning effort, we are contracting with the Edgewater Collective, which is a, a nonprofit-based in the city of Edgewater, which does a lot of work with um, the school families. So this one's getting underway now. Um, I think I can announce we've actually, um, yeah, we, I think we, it was public at our board last week, but we have selected Y2K for this study. So we'll be starting the, the formal planning efforts here um, in ED now. And then the second um, of our uh, pilot community-based transportation planning efforts is in the, the community on either side of Federal Boulevard from 50th to 80th. Um, and really looking at first last mile connections. Um, there is a grocery store in this neighborhood that recently closed. So there are a number of community members that are struggling to access healthy foods and, and uh, pharmacy as well. So um, looking at potential kind of micro transit or other connections in the kind of the, the one mile buffer on either side. Um, so this one, of course, working with Westminster and unincorporated in Adams County, part of it's in unincorporated Adams County. Um, and then we, uh, this project was also proposed in part by the nonprofit Growing Homes, so we're hoping to contract with them and a couple other nonprofits in, in this kind of part of town. So um, we, are, we kind of staggered these two, so this one will be starting in the fall. Um, and then I wanted to just give a brief preview that, of how both of these programs are going to be continuing as tip set-asides um, and coming up pretty quickly. So the corridor program, we actually have $3 million in the next four-year um, tip cycle. We do anticipate having two, two rounds of calls for proposals, um, the first one starting this summer. Um, this one's going to be a little unique for the corridor program because it is really explicitly focused on those corridors that are in the regional transportation plan. Um, we're actually going to prioritize all the corridors in the plan um, internally, and then we're going to be bringing that kind of potential prioritization to you all at the next TAC meeting to, to review. Um, based on that prioritization, which is going to consider all those factors I mentioned earlier, staging period, planning need, um, the Metro Vision goals. Um, we're going to have uh, letters, um, we're gonna, invitations for letters of interest for the corridors that are kind of the ones rising to the top where there seems to be a real need to do some planning work um, and they're coming up sooner rather than later in the, the um, regional transportation plan. So um, we anticipate having that that invitation for letters of um, interest probably in July and have some conversations with our um, local government partners around which corridors make sense. And then we're hoping to select and have a final approval for those first, first batch of corridors um, kind of in late summer. So keep an eye out for that. That should be coming back pretty quickly. Um, and then the next uh, community-based transportation plans, we also have uh, quite a bit more money in the tip set-asides. 
Um, I should mention both of these will be programs where Dr. Cog continues to retain the funding as we did in the pilot program. So a little different than some of our tip set asides where we're kind of passing funding along. Um, but we will have uh, roughly two and a half million dollars, which is quite a bit more than we had in the pilot program. So definitely encourage everyone, if you have ideas for the community-based transportation planning program, if you, if you know of communities that have some transportation challenges um, in your area, we're definitely going to be looking for ideas for this program. We anticipate doing a call for letters of interest at the end of this year um, and selecting programs so that we can get underway in the first quarter of next year. But this will also be at two, two cycles of funding um, over the, the TIP. So with that, I think that is end, the, the end of my presentation. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Ms. Kern, for that update. Um, any questions or comments from the TAC? I think Mr. Rigger has something to add. Yeah, so as Nora alluded to, these are both brand new programs of Dr. Cog. We're starting them as pilot programs and then growing them, growing them into um, the tip set aside, as she mentioned. Um, since Nora's way over there and can't kick me under the table, um, this is an opportune time to announce that Nora has done such a great job standing up both of these brand new programs, things we've never done before. Uh, we're actually promoting Nora to sub-area and project planning program manager, um, and Nora will be responsible for the half of my team that will actually work towards implementing the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan through programs like these um, to bring the plan's uh, priority investments to life through some of these specific programs. So. Uh, no, I don't. I think you did such a great job, Ms. Kern. I don't think there's any, <laughs> we're all speechless here. So I think we're all really looking forward to this new program, uh, both of these programs. And I really appreciate Dr. Cog putting together the pilot program so we can kind of give it a test run and looking forward to those tip set aside programs and prioritizing our corridors and community based transportation plans. Thank you. This time we will move on to informational briefing item number seven, regional BRT bus rapid transit partnerships. This is attachment E in your packet and I will pass it on to Mr. Rieger, manager of multimodal and transportation planning. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, we wanted to have this kind of kickoff conversation around this embryonic regional bus rapid transit or BRT partnership that's starting to form in the region. Um, first, a little bit of background on the BRT program. I know many of you know this, but just to get us all on the same page, um, we do have a robust um, BRT network in the Regional Transportation Plan, which I'll show you on the next slide. Originally based on RTD's Northwest Area Mobility Study that many of you participated in, also based on RTD's regional BRT study from a few years ago. Um, we took that work together as a region when we were building the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan and brought that into the plan, again, in terms of a specific BRT network and investment within the fiscally constrained plan to implement the BRT network over time. Specifically, the 2050 RTP includes 11 BRT corridors and a new bus maintenance facility. Um, that was true of the plan as it was adopted back in April of 2021 after we all worked together to put that plan together. Um, and then last year, you'll remember that we updated and revised the, the 2050 RTP um, based on, at the time, the state's new transportation greenhouse gas planning standard. Um, as part of that work, we made some specific commitments together as a region in terms of accelerating the implementation of several of those corridors within the network over time. So that is our official plan in this region. Um, it's part of our greenhouse gas planning work. It's part of our federal air quality conformity planning work. Um, and it's not just the work that we've done under the Dr. Cog umbrella. Our partners have really been involved as well. And I want to I want to acknowledge our partners as I will through this presentation because this really is a partnership. But for example, as part of the greenhouse gas work, CDOT also updated and revised their um, tenure, their statewide plan to include some of these corridors within the Dr. Cog area. CDOT also has a program, I hope I got it right, Jessica, the Regional Arterial BRT and Transit Improvements Program um, that's dedicated towards this as well. And again, not just Dr. Cog and CDOT, um, but Denver um, has incorporated this as part of their Denver Moves Everyone plan. Other jurisdictions have taken some steps. So this really is something that's kind of permeating throughout the region. Um, these are in our plans and you know, priorities for investment over time. 
What does over time mean? Within the 2050 RTP, again, 11 distinct corridors. Um, you can kind of see a little hard to see on the map. We've listed them out here, 11 distinct corridors within the 2050 RTP, particularly as part of our greenhouse gas work. As I said, we were pretty assertive around how we were going to implement these corridors. So uh, together as a region, you'll recall last year as part of that work to update the plan, we signed ourselves up to implement five of these corridors by 2030, extremely assertive, like no bones about it, another five by 2040, and then the last one by 2050. The costs that are shown here, the cost is presented in the plan um, by air quality staging period or financial staging period. These costs will change over time. In some part, they came from the regional BRT study from RTD. The cost today isn't as important. It's kind of what's in the plan as that initial placeholder. But as these projects move forward through the project development, through the NEPA process, uh, the plan will be amended. The costs will be updated over time. But even these planning level costs from a couple years ago in the plan give you a sense of the magnitude of investment in the regional BRT network over time. So in terms of the partnership framework and purpose, um, again, there's a lot of folks involved in this, as you've seen already. And so we are together standing up what we call multi-agency planning, funding, and implementation partnership. The idea here is that, as you've just seen, there's more work, right, especially by 2030, but even by 2050, than any single agency could do alone or lead alone or accomplish by themselves. It really is going to take a partnership in terms of the multiple stakeholders and jurisdictions involved, the multiple agencies, multiple funding sources, like it's gonna take a lot to do this and hence the need for the partnership to work together. Um, that partnership will collaborate and assist the multiple BRT corridors simultaneously. There's a lot of work, as you all know, going on in individual corridors, State Highway 119 up in uh, Boulder County, the Northwest part of the region, um, Denver Aurora with East Colfax BRT. Um, other corridors are starting to get underway. So there's a lot of work that's going on. The regional BRT partnership will help coordinate that work, help integrate that work across the region. Um, some initial focus here is getting these corridors underway, uh, whether it's through alternatives analysis, PEL studies, um, NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act work uh, for project development, planning and design. Um, obviously those first five by 2030 are the ones that that are of particular focus. Uh, Federal Boulevard, CDOT is taking the lead, um, I believe reviewing uh, proposals for a NEPA study um, or having reviewed, recently reviewed proposals for a NEPA study that's well underway. Um, East Colfax, as I mentioned, Denver and Aurora. Um, East Colfax Extension, we're starting, uh, we're leading some initial partnering uh, stakeholder coordination conversations to get that underway. Um, CDOT is about to kick off some planning work for the Colorado Boulevard uh, BRT. And then obviously, again, I want to acknowledge all the partnership and the stakeholders in the northwest part of the region who've been working on State Highway 119. Um, as Nora just mentioned in her presentation, it's not just these corridors. We're looking ahead to some of the other corridors that are later in the plan, but still important. So Nora talked about the Alameda corridor study, which is just an initial planning study, but we're starting to get that underway to set the template for project development work for BRT on Alameda. And then the other corridors listed there um, in the next tranche in the plan uh, to continue forward. So that's a lot of words. So here's a picture. Um, this is just kind of meant to illustrate visually the idea of that partnership, the regional BRT partnership involving you know, the really pertinent, the big stakeholders, local, regional, state agencies, um, even FTA um, has been invited to this as well. Um, that partnership has started to meet monthly. I'll talk more about that in a second. And then kind of as a, the sort of the, the spokes around the hub of the regional BRT partnership, um, again, is the work that's happening or will happen on the individual BRT corridors over the next several years. So you can see on each of these, either when they're opening, if they're close enough to open, or when they're staged in the plan, um, the ones in orange are the ones that CDOT's taking the lead on, the ones in purple are the ones that Dr. Cog is taking the lead on, the one in blue is East Colfax, uh, BRT, Denver, and Aurora. So that just gives you a sense of the array of the corridors um, and their relationship around the regional BRT partnership. So in terms of this partnership initial activities, we've been meeting for a couple months now, um, but starting to kind of you know have those monthly meetings, get our legs under us, getting a framework in place, uh, talking about things that you would expect when you start a new initiative, things like partnership charter, uh, potentially a program management plan, uh, looking at some grants, looking at some other organizational and framework type activities, um, but also looking already delving into planning related issues, right? When you've got all these different corridor efforts going on, are there things that we can do to find some efficiencies across the corridors? Can we leverage some resources? If a lot of corridors or several corridors are, 
in or about to, you know, go under a NEPA process? Can we find some efficiencies in there? Can we start talking about some commonalities across the corridors, recognizing, of course, that every corridor is unique and there is unique context in each corridor, but can we get to some of the regional standards or regional understanding around things like level boarding, branding, station design, operations, fare payment? I could go on all day, but this whole list of really technical issues that we're just starting to uh, to dip our toes in, um, but thinking about these are things that will be needed regardless of corridor across the region. Can we either standardize them or at least find some efficiencies um, as we go through this planning work in an, in an efficient and coordinated way? Um, and then, so I talked about some of those already. So again, it's both kind of the big picture issues, but also in the weed kind of corridor detailed uh, project development uh, issues. So that's really it, but just kind of wanted to give you that initial overview. Obviously, we'll come back with updates as, as we get our legs under us, but wanted you to know uh, that this is out there and wanted to thank the partners, um, CDOT, Denver, Dr. Cog, RTD, FTA, Aurora, others who are participating in this, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Any questions for or comments for Mr. Rieger? Again, uh, speechless. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Rieger, for this update on, or actually introducing the Regional Bus Rapid Transit Partnership Program. Um, I have, do have one question. Um, so with this pipe, with the pipeline of projects, especially when it comes to the corridor transit um, planning corridors, how, how do you see that working into becoming more full-fledged BRT and what's kind of the, the pipeline for that? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, that's a good question. So let me come back to this slide. So again, I mentioned the 11 specifically, or I should say explicitly designated BRT corridors in the 2050 RTP. It's these 11 corridors that you see on the screen. What our Madam Chair is referring to is that in the 2050 RTP, in addition to these 11 BRT corridors, we also had other types of transit projects that were designated, identified in the 2050 RTP, um, were given financial allocation as part of the fiscally constrained plan to develop some of those corridors as well. Those are called transit planning corridors. There are several of them throughout the region, State Highway 7, US 287. I know there's a couple in Douglas County. Um, there's others throughout the region. Those corridors aren't quite as far along as these corridors. Um, we know that they're a priority. Uh, we know they're going to be transit corridors. Many of them are still either very conceptual or just starting to kind of work through what do they look like, what's their vision, what kind of flavor of transit mode investment or transit service investment will it be? So the commitment in the 2050 RTP is that we will work together as stakeholders to further develop um, those visions and those corridors to bring them forward to whatever they're meant to be, whether that's also BRT or whether it's, you know, just sort of rapid bus or whatever it might be in those corridors. Um, again, they're both priorities within the plan. They're explicitly identified projects and there's financial investment associated with those corridors to continue the planning and visioning process. So Madam Chair, did that answer your question? Yes, thank you, Mr. Rieger. And thank you for the really thoughtful approach that Dr. Cog is bringing to the BRT system and efficiencies in the process. Um, Ms. Hansen. Jacob, thank you so much for this information. It's an exciting time for this partnership. Um, my question relates to how information such as like standardizing BRT systems, et cetera, will be shared out with the communities beyond the partnerships. Um, very good question. The short answer is I don't know yet. Um, but to be fair, I mean, um, that's one thing that we're starting to think about is just the intentionality of not just not just the partnership itself and not just, you know, the planning level work, the operations, all that kind of stuff, but exactly what you said, Gene, is how do we, how do we start communicating with the communities, not just communities that directly are on a BRT line. Again, let me come back to that map. So not just the several communities that are directly, you know, sort of here, but communities throughout the region, uh, right? How do we communicate what we're doing? How do we communicate the evolution of this program um, as individual corridors get developed? So it's a very good question. It's on our docket. Um, not there yet. We've had two meetings, but something that's very much on our radar screen, the thoughtfulness around how we communicate the work associated with this for sure. Thank you for that. Mr. Schmitz. Yeah, thanks, Jacob. I just, I did have, I, you were talking here about all those fun design issues, right, that this committee is going to work through. That's where it gets exciting. Um, one thing I noticed, you talk about payment systems, and, and there's been a lot of conversation in the past, right, about RTD, Mustang, other local transit, and how 
those can all be incorporated to make it easier for the end user. Um, and is that what we're talking about here? Like, because obviously we, this is just another potential system, right? And how does that tie into that network? So I guess is that something that is included or, or going to be part of those discussions? Yeah, thank you for that. I think short answer is yes. Um, you know, for all of these things, we want to we want to be intentional about the fact that we're not exactly starting from scratch. I mean, there's been a lot of good work that's gone into State Highway 119 and East Colfax BRT, for example, that we can learn from, that we can leverage, that we can continue. So we're not starting at square one, but it is one thing to do one or two BRT corridors. It's another thing to do an entire system. So what does that look like? Especially knowing that, again, as BRT projects, as transit projects, Historically, in the plan, those have been RTD projects, right? Because RTD is our transit provider. This is, I think, one of the first real evolutions of the notion that, as I said at the beginning, this is a multi-agency planning and funding partnership. There's, there are and will be a lot of folks involved in this work. Um, RTD is involved as well, for sure. But at the end of the day, it's more than just RTD. So we need to be cognizant of what resources can any single agency bring to bear, what things have already sort of been sort of out there in terms of like, say, fair payment to answer your question that we can leverage and build off of versus what are other things maybe that are new or that we haven't tackled before that together as a region, not just the partnership, but as a region, we need to come up with um, together to move the things forward. So not a super specific answer, but short answer is yes, that's also on the docket. Mr. Gaspers. Jacob, could you um, talk about the East Colfax extension and the Dr. Cog leadership on that? Yeah, no, appreciate that. Um, again, so it goes back to kind of what I said up here. First of all, let me come back to it. Again, based on this concept that no single agency can do this all by themselves. It is going to take a partnership. Um, it's going to take the resources, the funding, um, the talents, the time commitment of several agencies. One of the core concepts of the partnership is that regardless of whoever is quote unquote leading a corridor, all of the stakeholders will be involved to the extent that they want to, that they should be, that they can be. However, for each of these corridors, someone needs to step up in terms of stewardship and shepherding the planning process, bringing people together, hosting the meetings, helping to hire the consultants that might be needed for like NEPA development or whatever the case may be. Um, so again, um, you all at Denver are obviously doing that for East Colfax, CDOT is taking the lead on several corridors. Dr. Cog has volunteered to take the lead on East Colfax, East Colfax BRT extension um, from um, 225 and the R line to E470. So the idea there, again, it's not, you know, we don't have a bunch of engineers that are gonna go out and like measure things ourselves directly, so to speak, but it's that we have offered to sort of shepherd the planning process to bring people together um, to help, you know, see that planning work through, but in, in cooperation with all of the stakeholders. And that's the model that that CDOT is using on their corridors. I know that Denver is using on your corridor. Um, so that's just the idea there for all of these corridors in the partnership. Does that answer your question? Are there any easier questions? <laughs> or hard ones? I don't see any more hands. So thank you, Mr. Rieger. Thank you for introducing the BRT partnership. I think it's a really exciting program to bring collaboration and efficiencies to the process. Appreciate that. So don't go too far because you're next. Uh, also, um, I was just also reminded for some of the newer folks around here that we also have refreshments and coffee um, in the break room over here and the restrooms are just our, uh, down the hall behind us. So feel free to uh, take some of those snacks. Uh, item number eight in your packet is North I-25 corridor update, attachment F. Again, Jacob Rieker, I'll hand it back to you. Yeah, thank you. This time I have a much easier job, which is just to introduce our wonderful speakers for this item. But as a little bit of background and context, you all are aware that there's a lot going on on North I-25. Multimodal investments, long-term investments, um, long sort of geographic investments up and down the corridor, all the way from Denver Union Station, all the way up to Fort Collins. So we thought it'd be helpful to kind of bring all that together. As you just saw in my presentation, it's actually one of the BRT corridors as well. Um, there's a lot of different things that either are happening or will happen on the I-25 corridor. So we've asked CDOT Region 1 and Region 4 to kind of team up and give you that comprehensive overview of the North I-25 corridor. So with that, I'm hopefully going to not mispronounce names, Abra Geisler and Stephen Henry with CDOT. Thank you very much.
All right. Thanks for inviting me over. I'm Abra Geisler. I'm the corridor manager on I-25, and I'm going to run through some slides here that we have for you today. And um, we're going to switch it up a little bit. We're going to walk north to south. So we're going to start in the Fort Collins area and then uh, wind up in, in your home, home area. Um, so we've broken it out into segment, segments six, seven, and eight, which I'll be going over, as well as five and four. Um, and then we're also going to go through the mobility hub network that we're putting together. It's really exciting that we can do that. And then Stephen will go through um, what's happening down south here. And so um, active construction that we have going on, seg segment seven and eight, it's a design build, a uh, really big project. It's about $600 million, and it stretches from Johnstown to Fort Collins, uh, 14 miles of widening, so a lot going on. And then segment six, that is a CMGC, also under active construction, about five and a half miles worth and uh, $300 million, so $900 million in active construction going on so far. And then we also have an upcoming project we just got funding for, and that's segment five. It's another CMGC delivery, um, and we're projecting that to be about 350 to 400 million with the focus on multimodal safety operations. It's much more than just an express lane project where we're doing a lot of improvements along the corridor. And um, like I said, we're wrapping up here on segments six, seven, and eight, which is really exciting. We're about... 88% uh, complete on the $600 million project in between uh, Johnstown and Fort Collins. It's um, quite the effort, three reconstructed interchanges, massive improvements on all those interchanges, 21 bridges along the I-25 corridor, two new uh, ports of entry buildings, so a lot of stakeholder input, uh, two parking rides and a mobility hub, which you can see some pictures here. We flipped 402, that was a big safety area um, in between that Johnstown area and Fort Collins area, and uh, quite quite the difference that you can see in the upper top uh, or the top left and top right pictures. And there's also uh, the ports of entry. We we added two new ports of entry um, that that trucks will now um, have to go through when they are coming in and, and leaving the state. And we're also really focused on the Pooter Trail. Um, it's a really great trail that goes from Fort Collins all the way. Um, through Greeley and Timnus and Windsor, connecting a lot of different communities, a really nice uh, multimodal trail there that we were able to help get under I-25. And then we also added some innovation with the UPRR bridge. We did a roll-in um, on that bridge, so the railroad was only down for about 48 hours, and, and they got a whole new bridge. So exciting innovations going on along the corridor as well. Now walking down to segment six, that's the segment in between Berthet and Johnstown. Um, it's about a $300 million project. Again, continuing, continuing those uh, improvements uh, to the south as, as we got money. We couldn't do all of these things, so we had to chunk out these, these projects. And we're about 85% complete on this project. Uh, again, five and a half miles long. We have the first uh, DDI in northern Colorado, which we're really excited about. We were a little scared with how we would be uh, confronted when we first introduced the idea of a DDI, but people seem to like it, and um, Bucky's liked it so much that they're putting one right next to the DDI. Um, we have 12 new bridges, so you know over 30 new bridges on the corridor, which is pretty impressive. Uh, we're also adding a new mobility hub, and um, yeah, we're we're going down the home stretch here. We've completed, as you can see in the yellow, uh, that's phase one. Orange was phase two. So now all the uh, northbound traffic is on the southbound barrel, and we're finishing out uh, paving on the on the northbound side, which will be done um, later this fall. Um, so really excited and, and nearing completion on on these big projects. Here's some side by sides of of the transformation along the corridor. Uh, State Highway 56 is, is the slide that you're seeing now. On that top left picture, you can see uh, the really vast turn of the interstate that happens there. If, if any of you are familiar with the old dirt track, um, it was in the worst place ever because we were making people turn and go up and watch people flying through the air on the dirt bike. So not surprisingly enough, it was the most dangerous part uh, along the, the North I-25 corridor. So. We really wanted to study there and, and do some 
um, investment of how we could make that better. And as you can see through the slides here, the progression taking place, um, we did straighten that out and we actually flipped the interchange. So State Highway 56 now goes under the interstate and the interstate goes over the topography, lends itself really well to that. And you can also see the, uh, the makings of the park and ride and mobility hub. Uh, it'll be both a park and ride and mobility hub at the 56 Berthet exit where that love truck stop is today. Um, so really exciting things happening there. And this is the Colorado 60 interchange, the progression that you see. Um, again, top left picture, it shows the old layout. You can see um, on the, the top side of the picture that that frontage road was necked up right against the on and off ramps, which made for a really confusing and dangerous situation that basically was along the entire east side of I-25. Um, so we actually shut down that frontage road and worked with the stakeholders uh, and community members in, uh, I think, seven or eight different cities and counties. And we planned a I-25 arterial parallel route. It's hard to say one time, so I won't say it 10. And, um, and so uh, we were able to shut down the frontage road. Again, we thought we were going to be met with a lot of whys and confrontation. And um, we were met with a lot of, yeah, I get it. Why didn't this happen sooner? Like, thanks for, thanks for planning this out. So it goes to show you what a lot of um, good communication and also uh, just some common sense decisions across the entire, uh, looking at things from an entire uh, network can, can do for you. So back to the slide, I guess, um, Colorado 60, this is the beginning of the, of the DDI transformation. We were able to nest the two bridges in between the uh, old bridge, so we were able to keep the interchange active while we were building the two bridges, and then once we were um, done with the one bridge, we knocked the old bridge down, shifted traffic to that north bridge on, on the left, and then we were able to build the second bridge. So here's what it looks like today, uh, Johnstown made a pretty big investment in terms of making it the gateway of Northern Colorado and the gateway of the Johnstown community by adding some, um, some really big foundational pillars along the uh, bridge and also some landscaping that's gonna go in this summer and fall. So that's what's happening in terms of constructive, uh, active construction. Segment five is next on the docket uh, to start going where we just hired our, or we just got under contract with our designer. Muller Engineering is going to be doing the design on segment five and RLW SEMA is going to be our contractor um, for segment five as, as long as um, we success, successfully negotiate it through the CMGC model. But again, same type of thing. We're going to be widening I-25, adding in an express lane, improving bridges, improving interchanges, um, for about another six mile chunk um, going from Mead to Berthoud. So uh, it's going to be about 25 miles of total improvement in northern Colorado of I-25 in the next, probably um, in a total of about six to eight years. Here's the schedule. We're looking at a 2028 wrap up of, um, of segment five. We're hoping to lessen that, but this is our conservative estimate estimate of um, production. And just one thing to note in, in terms of these large projects, what we've calculated is time is money in the sense of every month that we don't build segment five, it'll be about one to two million dollars per month in just escalation alone. So it's a scary number and um, it makes you write a lot of emails at night <laughs> knowing that uh, time is money on this. And then marching down to segment four now, this is Thornton to Mead. Um, this area already has three general purpose lanes, so it's um, the least, uh, or it has the highest level of safety in the corridor, so the least prioritized in terms of where we're investing those dollars. Uh, we have about a 30% design for that area. Um, we're, we're shelving it, so we've taken it to a certain level, and then we're going to um, just kind of wait for money to come. Um, so nothing really to speak of in, in active design or construction, but know that there is a plan for that. And now our mobility hub net network, as we're building these uh, projects, we're definitely um, keeping in mind how we want to operate, not just in a single passenger vehicle, but also transit along the route. 
And so in the green, you can see transit operations that are already functioning. And then our orange is actually uh, transit operations that are under, um, under construction right now. So one is in that segment seven and eight, one is in segment six, and then one is in segment four, but we've advanced the mobility hub specifically in segment four to really connect those dots to get a, a really good operating um, busting system. And I should note we are also working with adjacent communities for those east-west routes that are so important to get um, local people to, to the I-25 corridor. So here's the, the Sentara Loveland Mobility Hub. This was, um, you're going to get a, a gamut of mobility hubs along I-25. This is really, um, it has a presence. It's, it's, the, um, it's the marquee of mobility hubs. There's a lot of uh, development money that's been invested in this and that is going to be invested in this. It provides an underpass underneath I-25, so a full pedestrian walkthrough under I-25 and it connects uh, developments on both sides. So it serves a lot of purposes other than uh, mobility um, in terms of I-25. It definitely helps with mobility underneath I-25 as well. And this is some renderings on the right side show uh, how the development is going to add to um, the aesthetic nature and just the overall experience that users will have. Being CDOT, we invest in concrete, and that's about it. Um, so the developers... Can, can really take it and run with it and make it a, an experience. And then the birth and mobility hub, I like to say this is more the boutique mobility hub. It's, um, you know, if you're 10 minutes behind and you need to get on the, that bus quick and you don't have a lot of time to walk, you're going to come here, park in the parking lot, and um, be able to, to catch the bus in pretty quick order. All these are, are median-loaded mobility hubs, which is a new thing um, across the country. So the buses will be traveling in the express lane, which is on the inner part of uh, the median area, and they'll be able to just quick shoot off of the express lane, go into the, the center area where the pedestrians are going to be, and then quick shoot right back on into the express lane so you won't have that jogging across general purpose lanes that um, creates a lot of friction and unsafe operations. So. Um, we were we were really thoughtful in terms of how we laid this out. They also don't have to wait at the on and off ramps and light cycles and everything else. Um, so it saves about 10 minutes of, of just not having to maneuver in dangerous ways. And then uh, the last one in Region 4 here is the Firestone uh, Longmont Mobility Hub. This is at 119, the Longmont exit. This is uh, a phase program of, of how we're going to build this, but it will be a working uh, mobility hub in 2024. So, um, yeah, just a lot of work and investment in, in mobility hubs. Turn it over to Stephen. I think that's all I have here. Thanks, Abra. Oh, how's that? Right there? All right. Is that good? Cool. Um, I like the way this presentation flows. So, because Abra has all these beautiful pictures of what's going on elsewhere on I-25. And then you kind of get down south a little bit and you have these kind of like these line pictures of, of just this design conceptual level. But it, it will be us in Region 1 someday. It will be. Thank you, Abra. Yeah. Um, and, and so as we go through, kind of keep those pictures in the back of your head of what Abra's already shown of divergent diamond interchanges and parking rides that are already under construction because that's where we're headed. And this one right here, Colorado 7, the interim mobility hub, I guess, you called birth at a boutique. Uh, then I'm going to call this one a handcrafted artisanal mobility hub. Um, this is an interim mobility hub. We're, we're going to add a, a little park and ride lot here. We're going to utilize the current infrastructure to create some, uh, uh, what do you call them, some bus slip ramps to get on and off, facilitate on and off movements for our buses as they, as they connect with this uh, uh, park and ride here. Uh, there'll be some other things. We're going to have some pedestrian safety improvements. We're going to have a uh, sidewalk uh, connectivity and some other things built into this project. Uh, the other, it, it's um, slated, right now it's in design, it's slated to go to advertisement at the end of this year, which means this time next year it should be in construction. Uh, construction to be complete somewhere around, I think, 2026. And I bring that up because um, if you step outside the confines of this presentation for a second and think about Colorado 7, there's a uh, starter bus service that's going to be operating up and down Colorado 7 that and utilize this uh, park and ride as part of the interconnectivity.
Oh, good. I hit the right arrow key. Okay. So the other thing, moving a little bit further south, we're going to talk about the site what commonly referred to as I-25 Segment 2. This is the area from US 36 to 104th. Um, we're going to, uh, we, we started this transit and safety analysis earlier this year. It was an effort to identify and prioritize the uh, transit and safety improvements based upon well stakeholder input, cost benefit analysis that took into consideration safety improvements, as well as transit mobility. Uh, this project is wrapping up really quick here. We've already written the executive summary. I think it's posted out there on our website. And we're about this close, uh, people, this close to uh, finalizing the report. I just saw the internal draft in my inbox as I was coming over here today. So that'll be circulated internally. We'll get some comments on it and push it out to everybody pretty quick. The, the, um, this study did come up with a preferred alternative, and I'm just going to let it dangle out there that, yes, there is a preferred alternative, kind of build anticipation for it for those of you who haven't heard it yet. Um, from here, since we have a preferred alternative, we've released a request for proposal or, uh, last month to help CDOT go through the design and environmental phases of, of building the actual preferred alternative. Um, the proposals were submitted last week, I think, so we'll be reading through those this month and having a selected, a cons selected consultant on board to help CDOT move forward with the design and the environmental phases of this. Um, right now, we think the design and environmental phase will cost about $20 million. There's $90 million in our 10-year plan available in the year 2027 for construction. And we're looking for additional money because if, as I click this to get to that, what is the preferred alternative? Um, it's basically the solution that was identified in the original uh, PEL study for I-25 North. And it's this nice green highlighted picture right here, which shows a median center loading station. And you go back to those pictures that Abra showed where, hey, look, that's what it kind of looks like. It'll uh, facilitate uh, the transit and mobility all through this area. Uh, probably a pedestrian overpass, maybe an underpass. We're still really early in this process. Who knows what it'll be? Something to connect both sides of I-25 and make it safe for the pedestrians. So that's where we're headed. Uh, we're really excited to get the design and environmental phases of this project kicked off. There'll also be um, probably some collector distributor roads that we'd like to work into this project, as well as some climbing lanes and some of the steeper graded areas of the segment. So here's, here's our schedule, and we're closing the chapter, and that's why this schedule ends in April. This chapter of the, of the study and the analysis is closing, and we're opening the next chapter, which will be the design and environmental phases uh, with construction beginning in 2027. So kind of cool. We're closing it, and next time we present, there'll be another schedule up here to show what our design, environmental, and, and upcoming milestones will be. Lastly, as you move to the southernmost point of this presentation, we get to the Spear and 23rd Avenue bridges. Those bridges are due for replacement. Um, and as we go through and replace those, we know there's a lot of opportunity for intermodal, multimodal interconnected connectivity through these uh, intersections. So we're going to keep that in mind as we move forward and check out what, what our options are in this area. I mean, maybe there's ways to facilitate buses as, they, as movements as they go through these interchanges or pedestrian safety as they move over these interchanges. Uh, right now, we're kind of internally at CDOT going through some of the various concepts. And when you see the potential cost anywhere between 80 to $200 million, and so who knows what, what it'll be in the end. But we, we look forward to kind of unraveling and start working on this project, too. And I believe that's it. Thank you, Ms. Geisler and Mr. Henry. Any questions for the CDOT staff? Mr. Mormon. When do you anticipate the express tolls to start up segments that you're? In quarter one, 2024. Thank you. So this time next year, it should be up and operational and probably on the tail end of our, our testing. Ms. Wynn? Hi, I had a question about um, the DDI. Um, was there information on like how to train drivers to drive through that or what was the public perception? Talk me through some of that. <laughs> we actually put a, a video together on how to navigate through a DDI. Um, and we have a lot of signing and placards and strong striping to basically guide people on where, where they need to be. Uh, 
Um, and then a lighthearted follow-up. Do you know when Bucky's opens? <laughs> yes. Um, they're thinking next year, 2024. Um, yeah, it should be should be a, a, a pretty big deal. They're expecting 23,000 cars a day. So that made us a little nervous on our brand-new interchange. I felt a little protected. Um, I, I have a question. Oh, wait, Mr. Heidright, go ahead. I want to applaud CDOT for the focus on median loaded bus stations. And I had a question about the Colorado 7 interim mobility hub. Uh, with that being labeled interim, does that mean the full build out is going to be median loaded? That's what I would expect. Yeah, I would, I would expect all those beautiful pictures that Aber showed, like a nice divergent diamond interchange so we can have our own, right? And maybe a median loaded interstate. I, I think there's a lot of cool things we can do in that intersection. So, yes. And that'll be out in the future. We're also building those those augmentations to the the new interim station. Are going to be we're hoping to be able to utilize those in the overall build, right? We're trying not to create throwaway work as we go through and build this. Looks like there's one question in the back. We, uh, a member alternate in speaking. Go ahead. Yeah, come yeah. up. Here we go. All right. Hello. Um, question on the diverging diamond interchange. Are you doing any intentional data collection around what the previous interchange was and the crash data was and how the new crash data will be like moving. How long has it been implemented, I guess, as well? Right now, the DDI is open only in one lane. We're actually okay. flip flopping um, traffic because we're still working in there with a lot of the masonry work and landscaping that you see. So I wouldn't say it's fully operational yet in terms of what it's supposed to be. Um, but yes, we will we'll collect all of that. We, we collect a lot of data at CDOT. I mean, we're engineers. so. Um, yes, we will collect that and we'll do some comparison, but that is one of the big uh, benefits of DDIs is that the safety benefit, you don't have any 90 degree interaction points, so it's all at a skew, um, which usually leads to property damage, but not injury like you'd see at a, at a regular intersection. Great. Thank you. I would love to see like a report of sorts potentially like highlighting that so that we can continue selling that type of interchange sure. around the, the region. So thank you again. And there's really cool maps that show DDIs popping up all over the country. So it's, um, it's, it, it shows it through the years and the progression of DDIs that have been added to the country, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll, I'll go ahead. I have a couple questions. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, could uh, Mr. Henry, could you give us an update on segment three and the status of that segment? Um, that segment is from 120th Avenue to Colorado 7 and um, is partially completed at this time. I think I'll have to get back to you on. I, I don't have much of an update on that one. Sorry. Thank you. And um, segment one, which is from Union Station to US 36, um, I believe that that segment was prioritized by a recent managed lane study conducted, I think, just before COVID um, by HPTE, now CTIO. And that was a segment that was noted to be one of the highest priorities for uh, managed lanes, uh, in particular bi-directional managed lanes, because currently it is only one directional right now from US 36 into Union Station coming in inbound in the morning and then outbound in the PM. Um, can you provide um, kind of the status and what CDOT strategy to work with CTIO for that top priority? Well, um, I see. You want to phone a friend? Jessica is turned on the <laughs> microphone, so I'll let her roll with it. Thank you so much. Happy to help. Uh, yeah, that was the express lane master plan that was completed by CTIO, previously HPTE. We do not have any current plans to do anything with that segment, segment one of I-25. It's not currently in our 10-year plan. So our focus right now in region one is really on segment two. Thank you, Ms. Piscobus. Uh, any further questions or comments from the tech? Oh, 
Well, thank you very much. I think this is very exciting progress on I-25. It's really exciting to see all of the diverging diamond interchanges, the mobility hubs, and um, really integrating safety and multimodal into expanding the system. Thank you. Um, we'll go on to item nine, informational briefings, uh, safe streets and roads for all, attachment G, um, Emily Kleinfelter. Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner. Hello, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, I am Emily Kleinfelter, and I am the Safety and Regional Vision Zero Planner here at Dr. Cog. And I'm just going to keep it, keep it fairly brief with you all today, um, give you a really quick overview of the Safe Streets and Roads for All um, FY23 grant program. And um, I was here th around this time last year giving you all an overview of it. And frankly, not a lot has changed. Um, the bipartisan infrastructure law last year um, did allocate uh, about $5, or $5 billion um, over the next five years to this grant program. Um, and so there is $1 billion available for each fiscal year, but there is this year an additional um, $177,213,000 um, that is a carryover from um, last year that is going to be set aside more for uh, planning and demonstration grants, which I will get to in a moment, which is, if you're not familiar with that, is what the um, previously referred to action plans were. And um, so also some other eligible planning activities and demonstration activities under implementation grants are also eligible for those um, carryover funds from FY22. So the total funding available amount for this year is almost 1.2 billion. Um, and as you can see, yeah, that's a, that's a lot of money to have us working with. Um, and so eligible applicants for this uh, grant program are MPOs or um, political subdivisions of a state. So all of us sitting in here in the room other than CDOT basically um, are eligible to apply for this program, which is why we are really excited for it to try and create um, excitement for it across the region and, and talk about both um, potential regional applications. So um, just some example is that there are both joint applications and partners. And um, if we were to look into doing um, any sort of regional application, we would be doing it with uh, you all as partners instead of joint applicants, um, just because of the sort of way that the, the grant is set up. Um, and then, uh, so one of the other really big new things regarding the grant program this year are the new minimum, minimum and maximum award funding amounts. So um, as I mentioned, what was previously referred to as action plan grants are now called planning and demonstration grants, um, which now have a minimum award size of 100,000 um, up to a maximum of 10 million. And then we also still have the implementation grants, which have a minimum of 2.5 million up to a max of $25 million. Um, those planning and demonstration grants are a little from the action plan where um, they are also encouraging the implementation or the build out of an action plan, um, but they are also encouraging folks who are currently putting um, a, de developing a, an action plan right now, a comprehensive safety plan to uh, apply for additional planning and demonstration funds um, that might fit within that plan. And um, let's see, other really new important changes that I want you all to be aware of is that um, as far as the implementation grants go, uh, the award selection considerations have been expanded to include rural areas, um, applicants that are in a priority community within the Federal Thriving Communities Network, um, and like I mentioned, uh, the minimum size has now been, been um, down to 2.5 million. Initially, they were only looking at folks to request 10 million um, or, or more. So now they've lowered that minimum amount. Um, and then as far as the type of um, grants that they're looking to uh, award funding to, like I mentioned, planning and demonstration grants are um, looking more to carry out either demonstration activities or continue doing any sort of planning in your region. Um, they can be bundled together into multiple activities and for, for that application. 
um, but you can only apply for either a planning or a implementation grant, or sorry, a planning and demonstration grant or an implementation. You can apply for both. Um, however, if you apply for implementation grant, you absolutely are encouraged to have a planning and demonstration element to that grant, which is a little bit confusing. Um, and then the other part is that um, implementation grants are highly encouraged to be in, uh, let's see, um, having funds, a large amount of percent of funds are um, being allocated to underserved communities. Um, and they also are looking to fund projects that support diversity with the award recipients and also looking for project readiness. That is a um, big thing that I have heard and read and um, I was at NACTO last week and we were in a um, session with some DOT folks and that was pretty much one of the number one uh, comments that I was hearing from folk was the project readiness is, is really important. Um, and lastly, just important dates that you should be aware of in regards to this grant program is that the application is due this uh, July 10th at 5 p.m. Eastern time, and they will be awarding the um, grants in two different rounds this time. They'll be doing uh, the, uh, sorry, the planning and demonstration grants should be hopefully awarded by the um, fall in October, and then looking to um, announce the award recipients for implementation grants later in potentially December of this year. So that is just a quick um, overview of the grant program. And um, yeah, open to any questions. Mr. Rieger has a couple of follow-up comments. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Emily, for that overview. Um, just a couple of key points that I want to emphasize. One is that um, Dr. Cog does intend to apply for an SS4A grant this year. Emily's been working really hard uh, to kind of think through that and put a coalition together. Um, I think she's talked to several of you and will continue to do so. Um, so I want to encourage that regional coordination. And more specifically, and we want you all to apply as well for grants, the version of the grant that's most appropriate for you. So as we have done with raise grants in the past, we are going to start doing this for SS4A. At the June TAC meeting, we're gonna ask you to, um, we will show the forms, we're gonna ask you to fill out a form for any applicant who's interested in applying for either version of the SS4A grant so that we can show those um, at the June TAC meeting. Again, that's information only, um, but again, we've done that with raised grants. I think it helps just for transparency in the region to see what, what your partners, what your colleagues are interested in applying for. Um, so Cam, we think that the due date that we're gonna ask for is June 15th for those forms? Yes, end of business, June 15th. So that we can include them in the June TAC packet. So just wanted to mention both of those things. Thank you, Mr. Rager. Thank you, Ms. Kleinfelter. Any questions? An attack? Mr. McAllison. Thank you. Emily, could you uh, and some more specificity to um, uh, characterize the demonstration? So are, the, are those projects or are those additional study and design components? Um, both, actually. So the, the idea is that if you want to do supplemental planning, um, you absolutely can look into to applying for supplemental planning. But if you also... Um, are not quite at the point of having a project that has maybe full community support, but you're wanting to, to look into doing some sort of pilot or demonstration project um, that also is not specifically called out within the safety plan. That is um, one of the kind of caveats within the implementation uh, plan is that they do want you to be um, implementing a project that is, is specified within your safety plan. Um, so that allows us to have some creativity, I think, within Dr. Cog with having no specific projects laid out um, within our taking action on regional vision zero, but allows us to, to have a lot more um, flexibility, I think. But as far as the, the planning and activity um, grant, or planning and demonstration, that is looking for folk, uh, or sorry, projects that maybe are, have some thought into them, but are not quite, um, yeah, ready to be fully like permanently implemented. Could it, could it also, could they qualify or be eligible as uh, pilot projects that are less capital intensive or lack of a better description, flexible and not, not as permanent? I would like to say that the answer is yes, but I also can get back to you on a more sure answer. But um, I think that, that they are looking at having both 
pilot type projects and permanent projects, but pilot would be definitely sought after under the planning and demonstration grant. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Um, Ms. Bartlett? Thank you. Hey, Emily, could you talk a little bit about your efforts? It sounded like you're putting together an application. Um, I'm going to look to Jacob for his approval to speak on it. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, my approval isn't needed, and we don't need to go into a lot of detail. Just the point I wanted to make was just to be transparent. If we're asking all of you to fill out forms and indicate your interest in submitting, I wanted to be clear that we're interested in submitting, and Emily's been doing a lot of hard work to kind of figure out uh, what that's going to look like, given some of the some of the context and changes in the program this year, we're kind of thinking through what um, given our taking action on Regional Vision Zero plan and kind of that regional context, what would make sense for Dr. Cog um, to apply for? But given our emphasis on safety, you know, we're really interested in the program and we're starting to work through putting something together. So, Emily, I didn't mean to put you on the spot in terms of specific details. I just wanted to be transparent um, that we are having those conversations and do attend to apply. But anything you feel comfortable sharing at this point, knowing it's a work in progress, is fine. Yeah. Um I will, yeah, I can speak to a little bit of the, the main idea that we've been exploring is taking a lot of, um, obviously, the, the planning and analysis efforts that we've done within Dr. Cog. And so we have, like he mentioned, the Taking Action on Regional Vision Zero Plan obviously has our high injury network and critical corridors, but we also did a lot of great work at identifying crash um, profiles across different area types in the region. And so taking that planning work that we've done and analysis to help us identify locations and crash types that we should be focusing on, and then also using the more recent complete streets prioritization analysis work that we've done, which is not just looking at safety, but also looking at mobility and accessibility and you know land use, taking all that into context, combining all of that different planning work for us to uh, I help like nail down using data, because frankly that's really what is useful for the FHWA and stuff, is to say we use our data to tell us these are where the, the most um, investment will have the greatest impact on improving, again, safety, accessibility, and mobility. Um, and we also, again, in that prioritization analysis, did a lot of equity work as well. So um, taking that into account, um, the idea is to basically identify a, a potentially 10 corridors across the region, um, across different area types, to implement complete streets, countermeasures, um, and improvements on those corridors. Um, I think that, again, there are some issues with how project ready are certain locations. Um, you know, how much is a certain jurisdiction able to, you know, provide project match, um, provide any sort of support as well as, you know, Dr. Cog cannot put, you know, anything in the ground. And so um, we absolutely are having some of those conversations around how can we navigate that. Um, but that I think is taking a look at what the, the requirements are for this grant program. What are they looking for a competitive application? They want, they want to focus on equity. They want to focus on regional collaboration. They want to focus on vulnerable road users and, um, and, and looking at complete streets especially. Those are all sort of kind of checking those boxes of what hopefully will make us a really competitive application um, is where I'm, I'm trying to focus our efforts. Um, but understanding that it does take, it's going to take um, collaboration and so um, I, I really welcome folks who are interested, and, and that sounds like maybe it might be up your alley, so please reach out. Um, it's something that we're still, like I said, having conversations trying to, to navigate, um, but we're also open to other ideas. Um, I will say that, you know, I know CDOT did the Region 1 bike ped safety study recently that they published, and there was a fantastic amount of work done with folks across the region and their team to not only do a systemic data analysis, but also a community input to help identify locations that, you know, are a prime, you know, uh, need for making it safer for vulnerable road users. And so, um, and then th that maybe checks the box of more uh, project readiness because they've definitely done a lot more work there um, as far as project design and, and actual location identification. So we have some things floating in the air, um, but definitely need to nail that down. So hopefully those ideas excite some folks and um, would be totally open to, to feedback if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one with me or anything like that. Um, but that's kind of where our head has been at with this grant program and how we're hoping to 
to navigate it, like I said. Yeah. Emily, thanks for sharing that very much. I'll just say for a little bit of context for us, we're kind of uniquely situated for this grant program. Most of the planning grants that were awarded in the first round last year are either for single jurisdictions or single projects, right? So as an MPO, not tooting our horn, but we are one of the few MPOs in the country with a regional taking action on, on regional Vision Zero plan. And so we want to get to implementation, um, but we're trying to feel our way through that um, in terms of what that looks like from a regional perspective, which could be either multiple concepts or multiple project locations. Um, it could be a little bit different because we think we've done a lot of good planning. Do we need to do a little bit more? Can we go straight to implementation? You know, what does it look like to apply for this grant program from a regional perspective versus sort of a more localized, again, single jurisdiction or single project type perspective? So those are just some of the issues that we're working through to try to figure out, you know, where we're best positioned to help this region in terms of something we might apply for. So if you're interested either in partnering with us or just kind of coordinating with us and just collaborating, I would definitely encourage you to reach out to Emily. Thank you. And I'll just add... I mean, if yeah, there are folks especially who are very interested, I think that um, creating a, a group of people to, to meet more regularly so that we can have, you know, um, collaboration and communication on this process, I am more than happy to organize and facilitate that process so that we can um, make sure we're all on the same page. Thank you. Mr. Kennedy. Thank you. Um, so yeah, just going back to the information form, I did send it out to all of you mid-April when we got the notice of funding opportunity. Um, but since it's been like two months, if you need me to send it again, or because I know we have some new members and alternates, send it to you for the first time, just talk to me or email me after the meeting, and I'll get that to you guys. Thanks. Any further questions or comments? Thank you, Ms. Kleinfelter, for bringing this update to the TAC and encouraging uh, local jurisdictions to take a look at that if you have a safety action plan or looking to update one or if you don't have one, this is a great opportunity. And if you do, it's a great way to move it forward to implementation. Thank you for the update. And we'll move on to administrative items. So member comments and other matters. First, we have the Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group. Mr. Priest, do you have an update for us? Just a short one here, and I think we're going to put a picture up on the screen. Uh, thanks to Lisa and the, the DIN team, the uh, Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group was able to go and tour uh, the, the DIN facility um, with quite a few folks on the runway there la earlier this month. Um, excuse me, taxiway. <laughs> it was very safe, I promise. Um, yeah, I thought it would be easier just to show a picture. We, I, two things that stood out to me, we're looking, uh, we, we're working with the DIN team to look towards 100 million passengers a year at their at their airport, um, which is kind of mind boggling to me. And also the fact that uh, I've been using this number and over and over again, 37,000 people work at the airport uh, in some capacity. And that's uh, bigger than a small city here in the Dr. Cog region. So um, thankful to the DIN team for that opportunity and look forward to more partnership. You. Um, Jacob, do you have a few updates for us? I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, first, going back to membership updates. Um, didn't mean to slight Mike Whitaker, but wanted to acknowledge that Mike Whitaker, who has been an alternate, um, is now a member. Um, so glad to have you in that capacity, Mike. Uh, Matt Wempe from Golden will be the new alternate. Um, so wanted to acknowledge that. Wanted to remind that Bike to Work Day is Wednesday, June 28th. Hopefully you all have seen a lot of communication about that. Uh, so please register. Um, again, I'll mention June TAC, um, June 26th, we will have a luncheon, um, starts at noon. Uh, we will provide more details soon, but again, encourage all of you to come um, meet and greet with your fellow new members, with our transportation planning staff. We want to make that a really fun event for the June TAC meeting. Um, finally, our staff continues to grow along with NORA's promotion. I want to recognize a couple new folks that have joined um, our transportation planning team at Dr. Cog. Max Monk is a new assistant planner in our mobility analytics group, so welcome to Max. Um, Aaron Villery is a new senior planner um, for active transportation in our, um, in our transportation planning group. Really glad to have Aaron as well. Um, glad to have both of you here, and you'll be um, working with them and, and hearing from them soon, so thank you. Thank you. Any other updates from members or comments? Okay, 
Okay, seeing none, um, just as a reminder, if you did not sign in, please make sure you do sign in or find CAM to make sure you're recorded. Um, and thank you for attending. This TAC meeting is now adjourned um, at 310. We'll see you on June 24th. Thank you. 26th.